Dr. Sharana Chadhuran at the University of Victoria, um, including was one of his classes called The Anthropology of Zombies. Uh, currently, Dr. Hiran is teaching in the American Indian Studies Department at the University of Washington, and where he's offering courses like American Indian Music, Indigenous Language Ideologies, and Zombies and Indians. There we go. So there's my title, right? Anthropology of Zombies, Frontiers of the Reanimated West. Uh, and I, I first conceived of this class based on an anxiety that I had, right? Because I was trained as an anthropologist, went to the University of Minnesota for my undergrad, the University of Iowa for my graduate degree, and then you know faced the prospect of going out there to teach in a discipline that I had a really bizarre relationship with, uh, like a lot of Native people do, right? Um, and uh, a question that I, I, I had for myself was, how would I teach an intro to anthropology in a way that was fun, useful, and really got at some of the issues that you know still continue to bother me about the discipline of anthropology itself, right? Um, and then I had this epiphany: why not zombies? Let's use zombies as like the object of inquiry, and let's see. Oh, it's, it's and, and let's use zombies as the object of inquiry or as the vehicle to sort of train uh, students or get students thinking in anthropological terms using anthropological theory, but, uh, but also uh, allow them to consider some of the consequences of those theoretical orientations. And zombies especially fit because they're just zombies, right? No one cares. Right? There's no zombie advocacy group or anything like that. No one's going to be offended by zombie mascots and all these sorts of things. Right? They're not real people. So I thought, perfect, you know, because heaven knows we need anthropologists who have had some practice in dealing with difference and people who are different before they go out and try to do what they want to do. Right? Um, and so that was sort of the, the drive behind the design of my course. Computer again. All right, so. I'll talk a little bit about zombies uh, in, a, in a broader sort of historical way. Um, you know, for those, uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar with what zombies are, where they sort of come from, um, uh, zombie is a term that first came from uh, out of Africa. Um, you know, I first came across the term reading, you know, Victor Turner's stuff on you know symbolic anthropology, uh, and it's uh, the term itself meant a, a soul that had been captured by some sort of forgive the terminology, a witch, fig a witch doctor sort of figure, right? So somebody who had, who had captured somebody's soul and then was able to control their will or get them to do something or just had some sort of uh, 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 hold on that. Um, once that idea came across the Atlantic uh, in the context of, you know, uh, colonial slave trade and all that sort of stuff, uh, uh, it, it changed, it, it somewhat changed and shifted uh, to actual bodily control of an individual, right? So the zombie of the, of the Caribbean, um, and around the Gulf of Mexico or wherever, uh, uh, turned into something that was much more tangible, much more direct, much more, you know, master versus slave kind of relationship. Um, as, as, uh, as time went on and, and as zombies became uh, had entered into the public imagination largely through a lot of anthropological work from like Zora Neale Hurston and some others in the 1920s, uh, as well as some other sort of avenues into the public consciousness. Uh, the zombie uh, shifted, right? Uh, shifted as it, as it entered into films and literature, it shifted through the 20th century into, into what most of us think of zombies are now, which are just these unceasing never tiring sort of figures that just eat people over and over and over again and, and without stopping, right? This, uh, they're driven by this uncontrolled appetite for something, you know, it's brains or it's bodies or it's whatever. whatever. Um, but uh, by the end of the 20th century, into the 21st, what, uh, at least, uh, what a lot of uh, literary criticism, critical theories and some social scientific theories are treating, uh, this concept of uh, a zombie and something else, you know, dictated, you know, subtly, as a double I at the end, uh, treating zombies as a post-human condition, as a blend of biological and mechanical or technological elements in a person, but uh, usually associated with some sort of horde, right? A mindless sort of horde. 
uh, kind of like, I guess we can compare it to like the Borg, right? This opens up the consideration of Star Trek's the Borg as zombies, right? <clears throat> But we all know who holds the field as far as defining what zombies are in the popular imagination, which is George Romero, right? So 1968 rolls around and he pumps, he, you know, an independent production, arguably the most profitable independent film, horror film certainly ever, right? Uh, they whip together this thing called Night of the Living Dead and released it in 1968. Um, it gets a lot of attention, uh, uh, largely on the basis of his happened to cast uh, an African-American in the lead role as the hero, right? Uh, and this was, uh, this was a, a few different intersections of happenstance and chance and just them trying to be hip and cool and kind of edgy uh, with some very real history, what was going on at the time, 1968, right? As it so happens, when they had you know, finalized the print and we were, we were driving it to the distributors was the night that Martin Luther King was shot, right? So people had race on their minds, all right? And in, and in terms of uh, public awareness of what was happening in terms of the civil rights struggle and the things leading up to the civil rights struggle, the idea of uh, an African-American protagonist in a film was really new. I mean, this is just months after Poitier, right? Um, uh, and, and, in, and, and so people have paid a lot of attention to the matters of race and, and racialized representation in the film to the point where uh, <coughs> Uh, there's actually some controversy over just how much of that was intentional, how much of it was politically driven, and how much of it was just a matter of, you know, random intersections of time and place and people. Um, but it was immediately recognized for what it was, which was still, uh, even without the casting of an African American in the lead role, still managed to be pretty subversive. I mean, he's playing with all kinds of taboos about incest and cannibalism and all these sorts of things, right? It's edgy, it's frightening, it's gory, it's unrated. Right, this is before the MPAA, so little kids are in the audience, they're like 10 year olds freaking out and all this sort of stuff. Right? Um, so they knew that it was an important film, and now it's you know, in the Library of Congress as a work of great something, right? It's been honored. Um, uh, the, 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 the storyline that is presented in there pre is, is just one of everything failing. Every social institution that we've come to depend upon, from the government to the press to the military, to, to right down to the, the nuclear family structure of American life, everything failed miserably. Right? Uh, and through it all, we have this dude, this African American guy who's, who's uh, you know, he's resourceful and he's innovative and he's armed and he's beating up white guys. Right? Uh, he punches a blonde and knocks her out. Right? Uh, all these sorts of buttons are being pushed through the film, and so uh, given the context, it's understandable that they're finding out other parallels to the lived experience of the civil rights era. So by the end, again, I pressed the wrong button. At the end, once the, uh, the, the living, the posse of the living come to reimpose order onto the landscape that have been overrun by these zombies, we're, we're faced with a series of images that can only bring to mind images that were already in the newspapers at the time or on television at the time. Right? So while we have a filmic representation of, of cops and associated National Guardsmen and just guys with rifles going out popping zombies in the head and chasing them down with their dogs, it's really easy to see parallels to you know, images of, of civil rights and race riots in other cities around the country that were happening at the time. Um, one of the most disturbing things that has received a lot of attention in the literature is the treatment of Ben himself. Right? He's the hero. But since this is such a pessimistic tale, he, he has to die too. Right? He, he survives through the whole film. You know, he's the, he's the, the center of, of all the attention. And he ends up being shot in the head by a posse of white guys who are clearing the landscape of the zombies. He's mistaken for a zombie. Right? And after he's shot, he's dragged out and burned. Right? And so images of his body being removed from the house and dragged out onto the pyre uh, over the end credits, which are black and white photographs that were then rendered even grainier on film than they, than they otherwise would have been, looked a whole lot like what you could find in, 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 in the press of the time and certainly in, in people's living memories. Newspaper documentations of lynchings treatment of African-American bodies by, by gangs of white men, right? So this was uh, pressing a whole lot of different sorts of buttons in the popular imagination and in the culture of, uh, of the United States, right, uh, in particular. 
Um, but, be, but again, because he's, it's just a zombie film, that opens up a safe place to consider all these issues in a way that's sort of distanced from the, you know, what had been or was the lived experience or at least the, the hearsay experience of the American public, right? Um, so why are we scared of zombies? I mean, aside from the social criticism and those sorts of anxieties, why are we afraid of zombies? And it really has to do with, with uh, how, they are, uh, how they are understood, how they're defined. What are the common features of, of, of zombies in film and in literature now, right? Um, obviously, they're undead. There's something different about them. We, can, we can't categorize them as live or dead. There's something else. They're, they're to kill, they can kill you. They can rip your body apart. They can do all sorts of gory things to you, right? They're mortally dangerous. They're tireless. They will not stop. They're unceasing. They're often cannibalistic, though not always, right? Uh, often cannibalistic, which of course opens up uh, considerations of that, you know, ancient horror of cannibalism in the European imagination. They always wreck stuff. They present disorder to all of society. Um, uh, our usual responses to reimposing order in the face of this sort of threat often fall apart, right? Uh, they just uh, <coughs> life from going on as we knew it at that point in time. And of course, you can't reason with them. You can't frighten them, you can't scare them, you can't talk them out of whatever they want to do, right? In other words, they're the savage of the European imagination going back at, oh, what, 600 years at least, right? <clears throat> that sort of oppositional identification of everything that is potentially wrong or needs to be managed out of a civilized population is embodied in this zombie figure. They are uh, the ultimate other. <clears throat> now this goes to, to a, a few different strains of thought within, at least within American Indian studies and anthropology to a degree, which is uh, an understanding that in terms of American cultural identity, and even in, in certain uh, contexts in, in Europe, right, uh, in contexts of, of civil understanding of civilized identity, it's an oppositional identity. It's defined by that which it is not, right? We can't understand civilization without first having an understanding of what savagery is. Um, that plays out across all sorts of dimensions of human differentiations, like race and class and gender and all those things that anthropologists love to talk about, where you can't understand one without having the other. They balance each other out, and they're supposed to be completely separate, dichotomous, right? One category or the other. In terms of depictions and descriptions of American Indian populations, as traced by Robert Burkhofer and a variety of others, uh, in, in at least the, the late part of the 20th century, <clears throat> they point out how uh, looking at the lens and looking at human difference through uh, just seeing how they are different from you in, in reference to the self uh, opens up the door for, for, uh, uh, for moral judgments of the person who is different from you that masquerades as ethnographic description, that masquerades as a cultural de description, that masquerades as you know, uh, an actual, logical, observed understanding of that other person. In other words, as an oppositional construction, it actually reveals more about the values and orientations of the person who's making the description than of the person they're attempting to describe. Now, in structuralism, which, you know, we're all passe and we're all, you know, beyond this now, right? Uh, in, 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 uh, in structuralism, it's a, uh, structuralist and social theorists presume all of these oppositional constructions throughout the cultural logics of uh, pretty much any human context, right? Uh, they, they assume this universal underlying logic based on binary oppositions that would potentially explain every culture, every way of thinking, everything about life, right? Uh, uh, human understandings of life. So we have stuff like, you know, the raw versus the cooked, or the public versus the private, or the hot versus the cold, or the wet versus the dry, or these organizing principles uh, that are used to base an entire cultural expression on. Now, uh, all of these, all these binaries, of course, at, at the base, rest on the, what is supposedly the ultimate inviolable binary opposition between life and death itself. That's completely dichotomous. 
um, any sort of gray area within these oppositions across the spectrum of oppositional identifications is a source of anxiety. We have to worry. Well, how are we going to define this? How are we going to understand this? How are we going to control this? How are we going to manage this? How are we going to contain this? Right? So gray areas are the source of fear in zombie films because zombies are, of course, an embodiment of blurring the dichotomy between alive and dead in the first place. Um, individual life itself is hard for us to define. It doesn't take a lot of imagination or very much attention to the popular press or anything to realize that how do you define the beginning and end of life is a source of constant debate. Right? Um, uh, the uh, death is, itself is supposed to be definitive, right? but we've seen instances in the news and in politics where where uh, you know the the extension of death beyond certain definitions have been used for political purposes, you know, sort of milk that gray area in a lot of ways. Zombies defy these categories, and what Romero added to zombies defying this category was the possibility of us becoming one by being bitten or whatever, whatever the vector of infection or whatever it is. The possibility of us becoming a zombie then sets up all these. Uh, further, uh, you know, exploding anxieties about uh, about uh, zombies being a blend of a human self and some undead other, and so then we ourselves can imagine imagine being a blend, a problematic, ambivalent blend of all these social definitions that we use to make sense of our lives. <coughs> now, <clears throat> the gray areas uh, in Romero's later work become more and more pointed. I'm going to spend a little bit of time about Dawn of the Dead. Uh, Dawn of the Dead was a sequel to Night of the Living Dead that came out 10 years after the fact, right, 1978. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's his continued uh, use of zombie films to make a social critique here. Uh, of course, what he's drawing is zombie, cons zombie consumption as being a, uh, zombies consumption of the living as being a parallel to mindless consumerism in American life, right? And so it's 1978. Uh, several of you weren't even born yet. I'm so old. But 1978 was set in a mall. One of the first malls in the United States. It's not like today where there's one in every corner. Right? It's a new cultural institution. People were trying to process what the, the mall itself stood for. This is what Romero thought it stood for. Um, uh, and then uh, this also marks a, a recognition of those anxieties of the blurring of the categories that zombies inspire in people, the fear. Because unlike at Night of the Living Dead, where zombies, they're not even called zombies, they're those things. Right? Don't look at it as an object. This is the first time in the Romero films where, where somebody uh, refers to them as, they're us. They're just like us. Right? And that, that, uh, that consciousness of the problem of distinguishing us versus them is something that he has milked throughout all of his zombie movies ever since. And a lot of people have attempted to imitate that too. Um, and of course it's obvious when you talk about American consumerism. <laughs> there. <laughs> so, So how does this work, right? So these binary distinctions, these binary oppositions that we use to, to organize our understanding of reality, our understanding of people, our understanding of society, right? These binary brandings have a long tradition within structuralist and post-structuralist thought. And as Foucault tells us, the, these categorizations are, are spread and reproduce over time. Right? It's not enough just to brand people crazy and sane or healthy versus sick or harmless versus dangerous or, or whatever. And also, uh, as Foucault says in his uh, historicization of the rise of the state, right, the power to define or the power to, to define somebody as being aberrant has shifted away from just excluding people, you know, like the leper colony or the dungeon and putting them all far away. More towards how do you manage them, how do you incorporate them, how do you, how do you treat them, how do you regard them, you know, what place do you make for them? Right? It's no longer a matter of hiding people away, but now it's a matter of, uh, as he says in panopticism, keeping an eye on them, and of course then doing experiments on them to try to figure out how to help them. Right? Um, the power to define through these categorizations right, is, is, uh, is itself the, uh, it's a domineering, guiding force behind every social institution that we can imagine, every social institution that's at least connected to the state. 
every school, every prison, every hospital, every church, every bank, right? All of these institutions are all about how do you define populations and then how do you treat them according to how they are categorized as human beings. Um, this, is, this is the discipline that Foucault is on and on and on about, uh, which is uh, ultimately an, or, you know, results in uh, the question of how, how does a colony, colonial management of the population, not just colonial management of the colonizer uh, or by the colonizer of the colonized, but also how do, coloni how do colonies manage their own populations? <clears throat> which brings us neatly up to its third bell, Day of the Dead, which was released in 1985. Right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's set in a military slash medical research scientific bunker thing. Uh, there's uh, and and. The, the, the different parts of this bunker, you know, post-apocalypse, post-zombie uprising, however you want to characterize it, they're both trying to come to terms with how to deal with this change in circumstance, how to deal with the zombies that are out there. Um, the thing that, uh, that I couldn't help but notice was uh, the different avenues for dealing with this now new problem population on the American landscape, and here, you know, these zombies, matches the very same uh, questions of how to deal with other minoritized and especially indigenous populations in the United States. On one hand, you have the military. On the other hand, you have the scientific establishment. Do we exterminate them? Or do we treat them? Rehabilitate them? Educate them? Uh, Day of the Dead uh, is where, zombie be where Romero begins to regard the zombies as a race that needs to be somehow understood, defined, and then either incorporated or eliminated into the general population somehow. <clears throat> and uh, in treating, uh, I mean, he never says this is what he's doing, but in treating it as a, a, a problem to be understood and then therefore controlled, <coughs> the, the very label of zombie itself uh, incorporates all these other uh, debates and problems and anxieties that are always associated with how to deal with uh, a different type of person within the population. <clears throat> in other words, uh, by racializing zombies in this way, the, the, the racialization of zombies serves to distinguish the social usefulness of, of, of zombies themselves. Are they target practice or are they a scientific experiment waiting to happen? And, and, and racism, again, you know, extending from Foucault, has always been about uh, distinguishing the social usefulness of some populations over, and usually in comparison to, and usually in service of, some other groups. Right? But it also imposes a hierarchy within groups, you know, which, which groups are worse off, or better off, or more manageable, or less manageable, um, all the way up and down the line, throughout every distinction of humanity that we can make in any complex society. That hierarchy of, of which population is able to be rehabilitated versus which population just must be punished all the time uh, is explained in, in a lot of ways through discourses that are related to evolutionism. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and how do you categorize people and how do you explain uh, your understanding of people and how do you justify that? And if we look at how zombies are represented in Day of the Dead, We can see we can see a certain evolutionist directive here, an evolutionist aesthetic here. Right? Um, of course, by now Romero was you know maybe even been bored with people talking about the matter of race and Night of the Living Dead and all that. Right? So they're blue. They're Avatar apparently. <laughs> right. So he, in, in one sense, he might be stepping away from sort of uh, the usual understanding of race and racialization. But on the other hand, he steps into a whole other can of worms by making them look basically like ancient humans or hominids, right? With prominent brow ridges and the, the lovely teeth, right? Um, uh, so this, this, uh, the, the evolutionist view of things, this evolutionist understanding of human differentiations opens up to all kinds of avenues. Well, usually a couple different avenues uh, for you know, how to deal with them, how to understand people who are different than you. But they're the very same avenues that are, that that, that uh, you know even drive. I reference Avatar. They even reference drive Avatar. 
You know, do you militarily conquer them, or do you missionize and educate them? Um, in other words, uh, is it a process? That, and that process of elimination, from the evolutionist perspective, makes that elimination potentially more distant, less morally problematic. Because instead of direct extermination methods, evolutionist uh, justification for how to treat uh, a minoritized population as being somehow less evolved allows a person to just sort of passively or indirectly allow them to go extinct, vanish as a race. <clears throat> or uh, if, if you're more progressive and liberal, then, uh, then just simply assimilate into being one of us. But of course, managing uh, the po managing the, uh, the the incorporation of any racialized population requires a lot of decision making. Reveals a whole lot of anxieties, a whole lot of fears, a whole lot of insecurities, plenty of failures of logic because you know race itself is untenable in a lot of ways. But also, there's this underlying sense, despite the lack of logic, there's this underlying reasonableness to an evolutionist understanding of human difference. That could be used to justify one group having that power to even define those differences, and thereby control the racialized population that they have so defined. Including, of course, leading up to, from assimilation to ignorance to, to other forms of subtle erasure, right up to murder and gen all right, genocide. <coughs> now, I'm, I'm going to invoke Godin's law here. Well, actually, Menbe does. Um, uh, we see how uh, function fu uh, the function of racism is like a technology of justification and differentiation of human populations that's turned towards this how do you determine somebody's social usefulness and then treat them accordingly? <clears throat> Racism uh, is a way to, to justify all sorts of choices being made, exclusion, extermination, to whatever. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, according to Mbembe, and as an extension of Foucault, uh, conditions everybody who's caught up in this evolutionary way of thinking with the necessary acceptance, acceptability, of having to put some people to death, of having to make some people die, so that other people can benefit. So that life as we know it can go on. Nazism, of course, represents one extreme of this very same use of, uh, uh, of terror to control and destroy some other. But, uh, as Foucault says, every nation state uses racializing discourses to justify its own acts of terror upon its own population and upon the populations of others. <clears throat> um, such as indigenous peoples, such as people who are infected with you know, various you know, socially stigmatic disease, uh, and other minorities as well as, you know, externalize others out there, you know, enemy combatants or however else you want to define a problem population. So in Day of the Dead, we're presented with this figure who became everyone's favorite, right? Bob, everyone loves Bob. Bob is awesome. <laughs> Bob's learning stuff. He's hanging out with the doctor and I, I'm going to, you know, point to but not talk about, you know, the fact that he's chained in a room with three crosses behind him, so there's a whole messiah thing going on there. But uh, uh, Bub, is, he's learning stuff. He's learning how to deal, deal with things. He's learning how, to, uh, uh, learning how to talk. He expresses emotions. Um, uh, he has a memory, right? And he can even, he can even shave. Oh, it's kind of gross. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, but he, but he's, he requires discipline and restraint and reward to do so. But Bob is also, I mean, despite all the promise that he shows, <clears throat> Bob is also a threat to the order of things, to the boundary between us and them, at least for the military presence there in the bunker. And, and for the military presence in order to justify their use of force against this population, that binary between alive and dead has to be defended and maintained at all costs. Bub's skills at first are childlike, you know, he's like picking up a, a you know, a little, little razor or a little mirror or a little this or that, right, or the Stephen King book or whatever, right? Uh, his skills, his demonstration of skills are childlike, they're even kind of cute, but non-threatening until he's presented with an unloaded gun. 
And then he picks it up, he cocks it, and he fires it at a military member. Right? It's empty, so nothing happens, but click and it's done, right? So uh, he's a threat. This, this leaves open the question of how, uh, how do we understand Bob as a, per as a person with volition, with will. I mean, after he, after he uh, fires the empty gun, that's not a contradiction in terms, I don't know what it is. He fires the empty gun, um, you know, then the military officer is threatening to shoot him, the doctor steps in the way and saves his life, right? So then Bob feels, you can see Bob feeling gratitude for that and fear of death and all. He understands these things, all right? Which then begs the question of, does Bub himself have inherent rights, inherent sentience, the bare minimum that is required to assign rights to anyone? <clears throat> um, and if so, then how do we, how do we then, again, recognize and define those rights? And, and then what is the, the, the people in power, the state, I mean, here in this film represented by the scientific establishment and the military establishment, what are the responsibilities of the state to uphold those rights, whatever they may be, however you define them? <clears throat> Lacking definition of those rights, I pressed the wrong button. Twice. Lacking definition of those rights, the responsibility for those rights are unevenly met in Day of the Dead. Right? They're treated poorly, they're killed outright, all these sorts of things. Uh, they're, 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 the, the, that responsibility is unevenly met by both the scientific and the military uh, establishment, and ultimately fail with the usual uh, zombie chaos that ensues in the climax of all these films. Um, this uh, also has parallels to uh, federal Indian policy, where the definition of the packages of rights associated with indigenous peoples often lack that kind of definition. And that, that lack of definition has led to you know, a historical trajectory that seems to have gone back and forth and crossed between questions of how to deal with that difference, do we exterminate them or do we assimilate them, playing itself out throughout the colonial encounter. <clears throat> and we also see, without that firm definition of a package of rights associated with a certain population, that even in instances where that package of rights is guaranteed by law, you can still get arrested for spearing a fish. Or put in jail for trying to protect your lands. All right. the, those rights are often ignored in the case of expediency or to uphold the economic security of the colonizing state. And so we see how the colony itself represents the ultimate site where all these very same anxieties and definitional uh, categories and all this understanding of human difference have played itself out in perhaps the most extreme. It's in the colony where these questions are being asked and only partially answered, when rights are being only partially recognized, uh, uh, that, that all sorts of colonial violences exist because the state is operating in a total gray area outside the reach of what had been the common law or the official law or recognized law. There's some other form of law going on here. And when those, those jurisdictional overlaps or problems or gray areas, how it has played out usually has been to the, to, on balance to the benefit of the colonizer. Right. Um, uh, the the, the col colonization itself occurs as a moving frontier between the colonizer and the colonized and all of the oppositional definitions that, that entails. Civilized versus primitive, heathen versus Christian, you know, uh, all those sorts of things. And so within the colony, we see then the management of space, the management of land, the management of, of complicated and even competing and contradictory packages of rights uh, that are, that then are, and all of these are subsequently usually bent to privilege the colonizer. Uh, uh, and this is not just a dynamic between us and them, and the, you know, the colonizer and the colonized. Uh, because these definitions and these oppositional understandings have, have permeated all understandings of human difference, we can see how people, different populations, are placed on a continuum of various packages of rights and responsibilities and all that, and protections to varying degrees from you know, the ultimate place of privilege where everything is done for you and you can do whatever you want and get away with it, 
to people who have to be put to death all the way right down, right? And we see this play out in his fourth film. <laughs> Talk a lot about Romero today. <laughs> Uh, which I'm not going to show, I don't think I'm, no, I'm not going to show anything about this, but um, The Land of the Dead is a film that's set in a city, <clears throat> a barely disguised Pittsburgh, where, uh, which has uh, organized itself in a lot of ways parallel to uh, a lot of actually old Western films. Right, where you have the one guy who owns the town, and he runs everything, he runs, the, he has the law, and he has all the money, and, and people, you know, grovel for him and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and he's, he's holding himself up in this beautiful, big, high-rise condominium with, like, shops on the, on the first floor, and it's all gated and secure, and people are safe, and life goes on, and it fiddlers green, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like that dorm you guys got over here. <laughs> Right. And then outside of the Fiddler's Green complex is then a ghetto. A ghetto that the guy in charge of everything keeps uh, well stocked with all sorts of immoral diversions like prostitution and drugs and alcohol and violence. Right. And then beyond, beyond that is a huge gate, a huge wall that separates them from the undead. And Fiddler's Green operates by sending raiders out past that frontier they go take stuff from towns that are only populated at this point by zombies. It's resource extraction in the service of class hierarchy, which is off the damn colonial when you think about it. And there's a whole lot of things parallels in Land of the Dead to a lot of representations of, of the Old West in film and literature, too, right down to the hooker with the heart of gold. <laughs> colonial occupation then becomes the, the production, the protection, the dissemination of all these hierarchies, all these understandings of human difference, the creation of zones and enclaves with various packages of rights and responsibilities distributed according to you know, your social use, your social value as a human being or as a population. Uh, the, the subversion of existing property arrangements, the saying, well, this is mine now, and I'm going to control it how I see fit, and I'll give you just this much of it, or you can, you can have this piece of land, but you can't go over here. Right? All these sorts of things that, were, that, that then are justified by classifying all the people within these zones, within these arrangements, within these hierarchies, as being racially or inherently different. <clears throat> and, and, then, and then all done in the name of, res of resource extraction, of mining, of logging, of going out to the, uh, the zombie town liquor store and taking all their booze, or going to the zombie town pharmacy and getting all their medicine, right? We go out onto that. Uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, somewhat indigenized space to take stuff to benefit the colony itself. And, of course, along with the justifications for those human hierarchies, a whole lot of literary production, imaginings that explain and justify and make us all feel good and understand this. Brings us to Zombieland. <laughs> this is directed by Ruben Fleischer, released in 2009. Uh, Zombieland is one of those cultural imaginaries where we see how this all plays out and how we feel good about it and laugh about it. Um, have you all seen it? Who's not seen it? Okay. Wow, almost 20% of you have seen it. All right, so Zombieland is uh, oh, it's a complicated story, right? Let me start with uh, a little bit of background, right? So, colonization happened on the frontier. All these oppositional categorizations developed on the frontier, seeing us and them and all that. In 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner presented a paper about how American identity itself depended upon the existence of the frontier. This is three years after the official closing of the frontier in 1890, after the, after the wounded massacre. Turner argued that it was the frontier where people became American, where people uh, tested their mettle, where people faced the wilderness and came out on top. 
the frontier for Frederick Jackson Turner was, was the origin of, of the values of egalitarianism and democracy and uh, came into American consciousness where, where people tested their level of violence and aggression uh, to, in order to protect those values. Uh, it was the site where people became innovative, strong, tough, well-armed, and usually hyper-masculinized. Liberty came to encompass, or to stand in for all of those things. The American concept of liberty came to, under, came to encompass all of those things. Uh, liberty itself was generated uh, out of these values on the frontier through struggle against that wilderness. And from the increased distance from the European mindset, this of course is, you know, it's, it's highly gendered, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, uh, but we see this very same story happening in Zombieland. But first, a little bit more on Turner, I think. Yes, I'm right. <clears throat> the settler, the colonizer, at first goes out onto the wilderness to say, here's a pile of land that I got for free, and I'm going to try to develop it and make something of myself. <clears throat> but at first, the wilderness is too tough. The wilderness masters the colonist. Right? And so he has this whole thing where it takes the colonists in the railroad car and puts them in the birth of our canoe and all these sorts of things, right? Which uh, you know, we can read as, as being actually stepping somewhat down the evolutionary ladder some, becoming a little bit more primitive, a little bit more savage, because it was necessary to do so in order to survive. All right. So he starts living in a log cabin and having palisades and having all these markers, you know, even taking scalps. Um, and issuing war whoops and, 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 and the whole nine, right? Um, as successive generations moved further and further inland from the, from the frontiers, the frontier marched from east to west, and then jumped, but uh, as the frontier marched from east to west, the shifting lines of settlement and, wil the, 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 the shifting lines of settlement and wilderness um, uh, can serve to preserve the essential tension between the two, between the savage and the civilized. European characteristics fell by the wayside. Uh, the old country's institutions, like established churches, established in, uh, aristocracies, uh, intrusive government, uh, and class-based land distribution uh, was supposed to go away as the frontier spread. It was supposed to be more of the pull of Europe itself up by the bootstraps and protect your own land for your own good sort of stuff. That should sound kind of familiar to you all. Um, you know, uh, those, those old ideas are increasingly out of place. Uh, uh, and, and it was in response to the wilderness itself, right? The, uh, the wilderness is tough, the wilderness is strong, the wilderness just demands a certain kind of strength. <clears throat> uh, and he tracks uh, how as, as, it, as the frontier moved further and further west, the people on the frontier actually became more and more American more and more democratic, more and more intolerant of aristocracy, more and more removed from uh, the class system of the East Coast, and of course, more violent, more individualistic, uh, more distrustful of authority, less artistic, less scientific, and all these sorts of things, uh, and more dependent on um, uh, ad hoc organiza organ social organizations uh, that they formed themselves right, on this free land. In broad terms, the more America, the, the, the further and further west, the more American the community in this in this model. And so this is where he cites uh, the origin of American entrepreneurship, the the how discovery and innovation and strength and wit became a promise offered to all Americans to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, to work really hard and get whatever you want. Rugged individualism. <clears throat> And so he worried that the closure of the frontier in 1890 would halt American progress. They were freaking out. What are we going to do now that we don't have a frontier to conquer? How are we going to prove ourselves? <clears throat> so uh, he ends his piece on that note of anxiety. What are we going to do now? Right. Um, I have to say, I'm going to take a step back and, of course, say that Frederick Jackson Turner's theories were, you know, they're, they're, no one cares about it. No one believes any of it anymore, at least from a social scientific perspective. I hope. But it's obviously something that comes up again and again in the popular imagination. It comes up again and again in contemporary political discourses. Um, so the question is, what do we do now that the frontier is gone? How do we continue to grow ourselves and improve ourselves and make more Americans? 
course, at the time in 1890, it was the beginning of American imperialism, and so it was like, let's make frontiers elsewhere, south of the border, in the Pacific, wherever. But there was also sort of the kinder, gentler frontiers imagined, like inventions of new technologies, and of course, ultimately, the final frontier, space itself. Now, Zombieland Do I want to go there yet? Not yet. So <laughs> well, I will go there. Zombieland focuses on a character named Columbus. Weird. <laughs> Columbus is discovering America along a frontier against some enemy that he fights and proves himself, proves his manhood against. Where are they going? West. West. <laughs> to where? Pacific Playland. What's Pacific Playland? It's an amusement park with rides and stuff. What's the ride where the climax occurs? <laughs> They're in space, man! <laughs> they rode out the frontier to its logical conclusion. It's the very same story that Frederick Jackson Turner told us in 1893, happening 120 years later in what is arguably the most successful ZOMCOM in existence. Right. Now, of course, <clears throat> their path from along that frontier necessitates a few uh, discursive steps, at least, and a whole lot of violence. Destruction of the indigenous itself is a necessary step along, uh, along this journey of reinvention. Fighting against the, the ultimate other, the ultimate savage, is necessary for them, to, for especially Columbus, to prove his worth, to prove his strength. In 1890, the, 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 the rite of passage of fighting Indians uh, as a path to manhood, as a path to prove your strength, was such a thing, was such a, a cultural institution that with the closure of the frontier, Frederick Jackson Turner and many others worried how young men would gain that strength after that frontier was closed, and it became uh, later sublimated into some other stuff that we're going to talk about after I show you this, this bit here. Um, if I can switch, can I switch? What program am I using? This one. Hopefully the sound works. So to set it up, they're, about, they're, they're, they're going from east to west, and it's the middle of the night, and they find a Native American gift shop. Um, all right, let's go on. I'm thinking, let go of my feet. Why is she coming in and taking my fist in the center of Oh, my God. Language. You're thinking about fucking witch doll. <laughs> hey, wish granted. She spent the last 24 hours fucking us both. Thanks. <laughs> Good luck now, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to begin my three part apology by saying I'm a wonderful human. It's a pleasure. Wow. I beat wholesale ass for a lot less than that. You get uh, 45% power. <laughs> yeah. Come on, bring it up. Nice. Doesn't that feel good?
got to enjoy the little things. Even if that means destroying a whole lot of little things. So concurrent with the idea that the, the you know the closure of the frontier was uh, ceased, uh, the, the natives, the Indian, American Indian populations, tribes ceased to be a military threat, supposedly. Uh, uh, so then the practice of fighting Indians uh, needed to, need, that the aggression that fueled fighting Indians needed to find another avenue, another way to express itself, it needed to be sublimated or simulated. And uh, was usually uh, came to be replaced with, uh, uh, according to Hondur and other other scholars, um, came to be replaced instead of fighting Indians. Then then this is where we see the, the rise of playing Indian, but things like the Boy Scouts uh, and other sorts of sorts of uh, sorts of um, uh, those sorts of appropriative institutions. Um, uh, so then, uh, the notion of progress, the notion of the frontier became internalized, became individualized. It was all about self-development. Self and playing Indian at this personal level became a, a therapeutic or a rehabilitative act, uh, a, a way to, to try to, to show and develop the same types of strengths that had been won on the frontier, but through a different avenue. Um, and and the, the idea underlying, you know, the Boy Scouts especially and a few other groups like that was a, the idea that uh, the rebuilding of, uh, of the, the tearing down of people down to some primitive state or safely primitive state and then building them back up in a new strong way, uh, 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 strong able-bodied individuals were then going to be the, the, the building block of, of America itself, right, to continually create strong, innovative uh, individuals to, to, to maintain society as it was. Physical strength <clears throat> translated then into the racial dominance necessary to uphold the colonial order itself. Uh, physical strength became necessary to cultivate, uh, uh, since American society, again, uh, some anxieties that developed through the 20th century after the closure of the frontier, that uh, individual Americans became uh, so reliant on technology and gear and all that sort of stuff that they become weak. And so playing Indian was a way to, to, to build yourself up, to work out, right, to get stronger. Um, but the, 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 the playing of Indian, in the case of the Order of the Era, or in the case of you know, origin stories with you know, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan and the League of the Iroquois, uh, it wasn't just about playing Indian. It was ultimately about replacing Indians. With, and putting the colonizer in the story as the, the natural heir, 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 I can't say that, H-E-I-R, <laughs> to, to indigenous ways of life, indigenous cultures, indigenous cultural expressions, and of course, indigenous lands. And so, if we're talking about replacement, in the case of Zombieland, right, they obviously did destroy this gift shop. And I gotta tell you, as a professor, as a native professor who teaches a lot of non-native students, I enjoy the palpable tension when I show that scene and I'm standing next to the screen and the juxtaposition <laughs> makes that just uncomfortable. It's like, oh, I never thought of this before. Oh my god, what am I gonna say? Um, <laughs> Right. We have Columbus who's discovering America. We have Wichita Little Rock the women who are whatever they're vaguely defined as in most Hollywood films. Uh, and we have Tallahassee, the frontier hero. He's Daniel Boone. He's even got the jacket and the hat. He's awesome. He's got the boots. He's got a, he's got well, he's got hedge clippers. I don't know if he has a big knife. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, continuing with Sherry Hundorf, who was talking about how the progress itself became individualized, uh, returning to playing Indian at the personal level, uh, rehabilitation of the person, all that sort of stuff. Uh, where the hell am I? Um, um, uh, they themselves take on aspects of indigeneity, right? What are their characters' names? It's Columbus who's discovering America. Wichita, Little Rock, Tallahassee. These are Indian names. <clears throat> uh, 
Now that also includes another move that I wish I had understood this interface better. Where am I? All the way at the beginning of the film. There we are. We'll start from there. <coughs> tell you that this was still America, but I've come to realize that you can't have a country without people, and there are no people here. Now the United States of Zombieland. All right, so French guy. Did you just say that was disgusting? <laughs> <laughs> you were warned. It was on the flyer. <laughs> All right, so he's got this. Oh, America! Right, I, uh, those of you in native literature, that should sound really familiar. But, <laughs> oh, America, he's moved to apostrophe, right? Uh, so Columbus's journey starts uh, at the very beginning with a move to dehumanize the population of Zombieland. They're not even people, they're something else. The hierarchy of us versus them, of human versus zombie, allows for the utter debasement of the zombie, the utter debasement of the enemy, the utter debasement of this. Uh, being as having, of course, any rights whatsoever. They don't count as people. And instead become obstacles to progress or a test through which you prove your deserving stature of the dominator of the, of the new landscape. Um, in, uh, in Zombieland, uh, the individuals grow by fighting and killing these subhuman beings. Society itself grows by organizing the killing and eventual management of these subhumans, and everyone uh, profits at the expense of the zombies for whom the land itself is named in the film. This is utter displacement. Right. And then he ends with, at the very end of the film, I don't want to cue it up, right? This is America. The film is America. He's telling a very American tale here. <clears throat> and he ends after having all these rationalizations and definitions of what a zombie is and does not count as and the rights that are denied to zombies and the necessary violence that was required to make it to Pacific Playland as if that's a noble goal in and of itself, right? <laughs> um, he ends, you know, he ends with a, a little monologue from Columbus himself. Oh, I love saying that. From Columbus himself, where he says, you know, as they're driving out of Pacific Playland, he rescues the woman and the women and whatever. He drives off and he says, even though life would never be simple or innocent again, we had hope and we had each other. And without other people, well, you might as well be a zombie. In the context of American colonialism, when was life ever simple or innocent? There we are. clip and it's all good like Petunia. I mean, we, that's so, oh God, it's ridiculous. All right. Um, the stereotypes associated with Indians are gendered, obviously. Right? If I went anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and said, draw me an Indian, we all know what any kid anywhere would draw. Be a guy, shirtless, or in buckskin or whatever. It's a gendered thing. Um, Frederick Jack Turner's Frontier Hypothesis is obviously highly gendered because he's talking about a particular kind of strength, a very public strength, a very military strength, a very forceful strength, um, you know, which is usually stereotypically associated with manhood and masculinity. It's all about guys proving themselves to be guys. 
Uh, uh, throughout the film in Zombieland, we have this uh, completely inept individual who's, you know, is playing World of Warcraft and drinking Code Red Mountain Dew and eating pizza boxes and, you know, what's he say, virginity, perfectly acceptable to speculate on. Right? He hasn't proven himself as a man. Zombie land, killing zombies, saving the girl, doing all these things is his way to save or to prove his own masculinity all the way through. And his, and his masculinity is under continual threat and critique from the figure of Tallahassee. Calls him a bitch, you know, calls him Petunia, and, and all the sorts of bravado that that entailed throughout the film. Right? Um, there's other stuff in there too about uh, Columbus really wants a family. What does that mean? He wants to be a head of a household. Right? He wants uh, common associations, he wants love, he wants intimacy, he wants these things, and he's going to get it through Wichita, this undeveloped character, right? Who also is the only character where we find out her real name. She gives it up to him. <laughs> right? it's, it's a, all the way through, it's a demonstration of masculine power in very stereotypical ways, but in ways that deeply resonate with the tale that people tell about the origin of the United States. Is that good enough? <laughs> <laughs> yes? You also said you wouldn't mention Bub the zombie with the three crosses in his cell. Well, you know, see political, economic, and racial discourse apply to zombies. You don't hear too much about religion as per supernatural counterparts there, not weak to holy water or silver bullets or anything along these lines. However, there are a number of readily available uh, themes that can be explored through that way. Do you have any insights on religion as a way to analyze zombies? Uh, well, I, uh, I would concede the floor to Kim Pappenroth for that, right? Uh, if you're right and I was going to bring it, damn it, I would have given it to you. <laughs> he wrote Gospel of the Living Dead. He actually did a, 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 a Christian theological analysis of a lot of zombie films, a lot of Romero's work. Um, and he basically, his, his argument was that if we follow the trajectory of zombie representation in the, in the, of the Dead series, it, it actually lines up pretty well with uh, uh, Dante's Inferno and different kinds of sin. It's interesting. It's also one of the most well-footnoted texts I've ever owned. <laughs> the footnotes are amazingly beautiful and thorough. Other people have talked about um, uh, the fact that zombies are not a supernatural threat per se. There's not a, you know, they're not, they're disassociated from witch doctoring and all that sort of stuff. There's something else going on. There's a scientific aberration. There's an infection. There's some rational explanation for their uh, genesis, which uh, makes it more palatable for, you know, I guess what is now a much more secular audience, potentially. <coughs> I'm not sure. Um, but there's, there's, there's a few things that are written on the more uh, religious aspects of, of, of zombies. All right, I'm going to repeat that question for the purpose of the recording here. <laughs> She's asking a good question about how I would take a Foucauldian and Bembe like analysis of uh, uh, colonizers engaged largely in the practice of assigning certain sets of rights and privileges and denying certain protections to certain populations uh, and apply that analysis to what's going on specifically in Canada, right, uh, with, uh, with the Micmac situation. Do we all know? We probably don't all know what's going on up there, right? So, uh, you all know about fracking and the pipeline and all that sort of stuff. We're in Oklahoma. I better see a lot of heads. <laughs> There's a lot of indigenous resistance to that, and environmental resistance, and just people who don't want it in their backyard resistance to these pipelines that went through. And there was an action. Has it only been two days? I mean, there's been occupation and you know observing and paying attention to what's going on for a while. But a couple days ago, uh, when they started to, to go through, uh, the, the, the Mi'kmaq people organized uh, in resistance to, to occupy the lands that the pipeline was going to go through. Uh, and in the spirit of, in continuation of, as a part of uh, Idle No More movement, it was intended to be a cultural, spiritual response in resistance to what was uh, an economic extraction and uh, exploitation situation, right? But they ran into uh, some problems, right? So they have, they brought 
drums and feathers to a gunfight. They brought, they, they brought prayer to a military situation, and that became increasingly militarized very quickly from police presence, provincial police presence, to snipers, to full-on military gear surrounding them, and ultimately, you know, rousting and arresting several of them. Um, uh, It's unceded territory, which means it's not defined very cleanly by law. It's a state of exception. It's outside crown law. It's that very same gray area that has been the source of anxiety I've been talking about the whole time. And this is one of the reasons I love teaching about zombies, because it doesn't take a whole lot of scratching to find an example of a real life violent experience that bears out everything that I've been teaching my students using zombies. That's what's happening in Canada. That's what was happening in Idaho. That's what's happening in North Dakota. That's what's happening up on Red Lake. That's what's happening in Cass Lake. That's what's happening on a lot of places where these pipelines are running through, where the super low trucks are running through, where the coal trains, where they want to run the coal trains through. Questions of exactly who owns this land. It's an epistemological question with some very real bodily consequences. So it fits. And I just bummed you all up. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you so much for coming on a Friday night. Uh.